Welcome in the house of the Lord this morning. And you know, when Marissa and I got in, we saw the communion table. And it, I got goosebumps um, knowing that today we are going to just partake of communion also. And I want to thank the people who's made the preparations. I want to thank everybody for being here. And listen, God's going to speak to you this morning. And God's going to touch your heart and your life. And you will never be the same again. Amen. How can we be the same again if we have entered the presence of God, heard the word, worship, partake of the elements of communion? You cannot be the same again. Hope will be stirred. Joy will be stirred. Fire and power and anointing will be on your life. Amen. And to be honest, that's what the world re- needs right now. And I won't even be surprised after our service, you know, um, somewhere during the afternoon if it starts raining. Amen. <laughs> because we desperately need rain. Lord, we thank you. Open the heavens for us. Amen. How many of you will agree we need some rain now? <laughs> but let's get into the word of the Lord And I want to talk to you about loving God, loving God, and loving God through a lifestyle of worship. Can you maybe say this with me? Loving God takes place through a lifestyle of worship. So if we do not understand what worship is, it's going to be difficult to love God. Um, We love God in response to the love of God towards us. We didn't love him first. He loved us first. So when we love God, it is in response of what he did for us. It is in, it is a revelation we receive that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to bleed and die. And that's why we will sit at the table of communion here this morning. So loving God through, uh, can only take place through a lifestyle of worship. And by the way, the love of God is something completely different from the love of the world. The love of the world is often based on selfishness, lust, perversion, and many other things. The world does not define love. Jesus Christ, who is bleeding and dying on the cross, defines love. If you look at the cross, if we, if we consider the table of communion this morning, that is the definition of love. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus in this particular way that his body was broken and his blood was shed for us. And may I also announce, uh, you know, our Passover conference that, we, that will start on the 29th of March, fr- Good Friday at 9 a.m. here. And uh, th- that's taking place this year on the 29th of March. And then the 31st, I believe, is Resurrection Sunday. So it's when we, when we partake of communion again, it will be over the Passover weekend. So here's something else about the love of God. If we do not understand the love of God, have revelation of that, um, and begin to love God, we will also not be able to love ourselves and love others. You see, true love, and I'm talking about agape love, l- really loving others means that you, that you love yourself because you have understanding of how valuable you are in the eyes of God. So valuable are you and I that the Father gave His only begotten Son, Jesus. And as such, loving God has become the great commandment. When Jesus speaks of the commandments, he speaks about loving him, loving yourself, and loving people. Let's just read um, what Jesus said concerning the great commandment. I want us to read the great commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 38. um, Jesus said, or he replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart. With a part of your heart? No, with? Turn to somebody and say, with all your heart. With all your heart. Um, And then he also, so that's your spirit. We're going to talk about worship. What I want to talk to you about today is the the characteristics of true Christian worship. Characteristics of true Christian worship. Because we need to love God. We, this week we've celebrated Valentine's Day. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we celebrate Valentine's Day as such, but we, you can use it as an opportunity to just show your love for somebody that you love and care for. I thank the Lord, you know, my, uh, I hope as far as I know, my daughters, you know, they don't have boyfriends yet. Thank you, Jesus. 
uh, unless Marisa knows something that I don't know about. <laughs> and, and, and I've got three daughters, and uh, you know, I've ek, ek my whole geweer af stof. <laughs> You know, but here's the thing. Uh, so what we did this week, um, I said, okay, I will cook uh, last week's Sunday. So Marisa said, if you want to treat me, I want to sleep on the couch and you do the cooking. So I did some cooking. Can you believe it? Um, this is only the second time I've done some cooking on the stove. So you must understand the miracle. And she must understand how much I love her. <laughs> so I, I did the cooking. And then... Uh, uh, and then she baked a cheesecake to die for. <laughs> and so we celebrated our love for one another with the children around the table. And the next evening, we've had some, a, a communion and family cell, you know, celebrating the love of Jesus. Amen. Have you celebrated love this week? Come on, raise your hand if you've done. If you haven't, you are boring and you know nothing. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, are you boring? What's wrong with you? <laughs> okay. Bake some cheesecake. Buy some flowers. Come on, do something. <laughs> Have some communion. Thank Jesus for his goodness and his grace. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Jesus said, this will be the great commandment. Say with me, the great commandment. And this is the greatest commandment. If we understand this commandment, everything else falls in place. All the laws of the old covenant, all the mosaic laws and protocols and rules and re re regulations, everything is now summed up in this. Jesus himself said, it. you must, say with me, I must love the Lord your God with all your heart. And this is why we're going to talk about the heart, which is also... Your, your heart of heart is your spirit. And I, I want to show you today what real worship is all about. Because we cannot love God unless we understand worship. So, and when Jesus said you must love the Lord your God and he gave us this commandment, he talked about worshiping God and loving God through a lifestyle of worship. So he says, and all your soul... Now, look at this. Your, your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. Everything has to be submitted to God. And then again, he says your mind. Why? Because if your mind is not in it, you are not in it. <laughs> and, and that's the mistake we make, even in, in corporate worship at church or even at home. Our minds are not in it. We do all the singing. We will even lift our hands. But you think about lunch. You think about what will I have to eat. You think about, oh, this week is going to be difficult. And, and Jesus made sure that we understand it's important that every part of us is engaged. If the mind is not engaged, nothing is engaged. If you're not there, you're not there. Amen. And the same with the heart and the spirit. So, so he gave us the great commandment. And he says to his, uh, to, to his audience, he says, this is the first and greatest commandment. It's the first and greatest commandment. What is the second commandment? Not, he doesn't even call it a second. He says, a second is equally important. Can you believe it? It's equally important to love people as you love yourself. And I really believe this is where many believers get it wrong many times. I've said it, I think, two Sundays ago. You know, you get many churches. This church is a, they call a creative church. Uh, you know, and everything is about the design. This church has a good band. That church has got many lights. This church has a rock star pastor. That church has got a great welcoming committee. That church, this, that. You see, but what is really, what should really characterize the church of Jesus? Love. L say with me, love. <laughs> So I can be a rock star pastor, and uh, Pastor Carl can be a rock star uh, worship director and pastor, and we can have a rock star usher team, and, and everything rocks, you know. But if there is no love, it means nothing. It's noise. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's noise. It's a clingy symbol. This nux das nux ni. Love. Love is the thing. And that's why I go, I hug people. Uh, not everybody likes hug, uh, like hugs. I've discovered it. That's okay. <laughs> But in the meantime, when, when I come and hug you, just remember, okay, this guy tries to show me that I'm welcome and he loves me, okay? Now, obviously, I know love goes beyond hugging. I understand that, and we, we, we will talk about that in time to come. Um, but the thing is, a second equally important is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, people, we have to make sure that we love God. We start today with a new sermon series, Loving God, and I want to talk to you about loving God 
through a lifestyle of worship. And I want us to see what Jesus said about worship and then show you what, correct, what is characterizing true worship or a few characteristics of true worship. Let's read this together. John chapter 4, verse 22 to 25 says the following. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. <laughs> right there we can learn a lot. Amen. In other words, worship is not this protocol, liturgical, traditional kind of thing because many people think that that's what worship is all about. It's liturgical, it's protocol, it's this, it's that. He says, no, 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 no. It is who you are and the way you live that count before God. By the way, that doesn't mean it's who you are. Jesus just spoke to the Samaritan woman about the living water. What he was saying is when you receive the living water, you become a new being in me. You are someone new now. I've now regenerated your heart and your spirit. This, this is not who you are. This is who you've become in Jesus. Can I get an amen? You've you got to understand the context because some people will just say, oh, that's, who, that's just who I am. No, 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 no. It's who you've become in Jesus. Go read the whole passage. So he says, and the way you now live, now that you have become in Jesus, now the way you live because of who you are in him, he says, that's true worship. So true worship is more than just singing corporately. It's more than just praying during the week. True worship has to do with your whole life. Say this with me. True worship is a lifestyle. It involves every department, every part, every aspect of my life. Okay, let's get into this. He says, your worship must engage your spirit. Oh, very important. Your worship must engage your spirit. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Here he says it again. He says, your worship must engage your heart of heart, your spirit. He says, in the pursuit and then in the pursuit of truth so worship is not just something we say but there's a pursuit of truth which means there's a pursuit of doing the will of God in every area of your life that's true worship you cannot worship God on a Sunday and Monday you do whatever you like no there has to be a pursuit a lifestyle of truth <laughs> worship is every part of your life whether you're at school, at work, doing your business, that's part of worship. You're in pursuit of knowing the will of God and living out the will of God. But here's the thing. It cannot take place unless the spirit is first engaged. Can I get an amen, people? <laughs> so he says, so that's the kind of, now look at this. Jesus says that's the kind of people the Father is after. What kind of people? The kind of people that worship Him in spirit and in truth. Who is the Father looking for? People who worship Him in and in, in spirit and in. The spirit has to be engaged, and I'll show you what that means, because that means intimacy with God. You cannot worship God in other parts of your life if there is no closeness, no oneness, no intimacy with God. And that is why the corporate worship is very important. And that's why it's very important to have devotional time and be disciplined in the week. Because if there is no intimacy between us and God, there's no pursuit of truth in any, any other area of our lives. That's what Jesus was saying. So he says, and the Father is looking for people. What, listen, why is the Father looking for people like that? Why? Because that is your purpose in life. Say this with me, my purpose in life to worship God. <laughs> you want to know what, uh, oh Lord, what's my, what am I supposed to do? Worship God in everything you do. Worship Him in everything you do. And everything else will fall in place because then you'll be in pursuit of truth, His will, His will, God's will, God's plan, God's blueprint. You will understand what it is that God wants you to do. But it starts with intimacy. And then we pursue Him in truth. And the Father is looking. And why is the Father looking? Because that's our purpose. It's your purpose. You, listen, you were created by God for God. You were created, listen now, you were created by God not to do your own stuff. You were created by God for God. We have to understand that. When we consider our lives, 
who we are. It's about who we've become in Him and knowing and understanding us created by God for God. Listen, people, Christianity is not this religious thing. The Samaritan, listen now, the Samaritan women thought it was a religious thing. Many Christians today think the same. Because we know the story, Jesus comes to the well, he's thirsty, you know, the Samaritan woman comes, he offers her drink, she says, but you can't, you don't have a bucket, you don't have a rope. Jesus says to her, well, if you knew who was talking to you, if you, if you know who's talking to you, you would have asked me for living water, you remember. She discovers Jesus is a MOG, a man of God, <laughs> a prophet. Now she wants to talk about worship, amen? That's what happened, go read it. Now she says, okay, let's talk about worship. Our ancestors worshipped on Mount Gerizim, and she pointed on this mount. But you Jew Jews are saying that we must worship where? In Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, lady, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to give any offense, but let me help you out here. True worship is not about where you worship. True worship is not where you, it's not confined to a specific place. And that's when he, we read, he says, but true worship is about who you are and the way you live that count before God. That's true. True worship is not confined to a place. And that's when Jesus then shared to her, that this is the whole context before this verse, what true worship is all about. So he says, those who worship him must do it out of their very being. Why? Because God is sheer being itself. God is spirit. So you cannot worship God if it's not worshipped in spirit and in truth. And that kind of worship is not confined to a Sunday morning. That kind of worship does not only take place when you pray and when you're alone. As a matter of fact, Jesus was saying here that true worship is not just personal, but it's also public. Hello, somebody. Too many Christians believe that my worship and my relationship with God is a personal, private thing. It's the biggest lie. If you go study all the Greek, and, he w and I'll sh share some of these words with you in Hebrew with you, you will find that uh, it's even publicly. And by the way, how can we live our lives for God and people cannot see Jesus in us? True worship is, 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 is actually 90% public, 10% private. <laughs> can I get a big amen? You cannot hide Jesus. You cannot hide the fire of God. You cannot hide the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. <laughs> if you want to hide it, you are a 007 Christian, undercover. <laughs> then to somebody asked him, are you undercover? No, no, no. Because <laughs> if you are, you're not a true worshiper. Okay. So God is spirit. God is spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. If you want to really worship God... God is spirit. You need to engage the heart, the spirit, and be in pursuit of truth. That's true worship. Now, look at this. Um, so again, he says, every part of your being, your spirit, your true self in adoration. Now the woman says, all of a sudden, <laughs> she's got nothing more to say. I studied this. Some translation says the woman became confused. Yeah, she says, I, I, I don't really know about that. And when I read that, I stopped and just meditated on this for a moment. And it is as if the Lord was saying, many of my children are confused about the true meaning of worship. They are confused. They think it's confined to a Sunday morning corporate event where you do certain stuff. They think it's um, when you pray and have devotion in the morning. He says, but they need to understand again the meaning of true worship and let me just show you a few characteristics and i've given them there true worship is not about a place remember jesus said to her it's not about the mountain of jerusalem or the temple or the synagogue but true worship begins in the heart and it becomes a lifestyle listen when you go home this afternoon and you have a dinner with your family and you pray i hope you're still praying when before you eat <laughs> you, and you spend time with your family, you're worshiping God, people. Because you're doing the will of God for your life. Eating, enjoying time with your family, looking at your children, spending some time. Now you're in pursuit of worship. Amen. 
You see, worship is not confined to a place. Tomorrow when you go to school or work, you're a carrier of the glory of God, the presence of God. You live a certain way of life, which means that you are now what? People see Jesus in you. And what you do, by the way, at work, everything we do, we do for Him, which means we worship. We are in pursuit of truth. True worship never stops, you know, when we engage the spirit or the heart. It never stops there. From intimacy with God, it flows into it, say with me, it flows into every area, aspect, department, compartment. <laughs> Are you getting the picture of our lives? Not about a place. Secondly, true, true worship engages the spirit, heart, soul, and mind. Heart, soul, and mind. It engages every part of you. You cannot, listen, you cannot do certain religious things and think you've worshipped. That's a lie. That's not worship. Oh, I've been to this church, I've raised my hands, I've shouted, when pastor said I'm a shouted, I've worshipped. But if your heart is not engaged, it's not true worship. Can I ask you, was your heart engaged this morning in the worship? Or did you think about, oh, it's hot in this place, when are they going to get acorns? But you never tithe, but you want acorns. <laughs> don't take offense, please, don't. <laughs> Okay, oh, oh, you know, the, oh, they're singing a new song. Where do they get this Adonai manifest your presence song? I can't even find it. <laughs> your spirit is not engaging. <laughs> okay, amen. Start thinking about your week. Start thinking about what you're going to do. All the things, your spirit's not engaging. But you're in the place of worship. You're like that Samaritan woman. But, you know, our father said we must go to church. We must worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. I've been to JFN. You haven't worshipped. Your spirit wasn't engaged. Third important characteristics. True worship is, is your purpose. Your life has to be characterized by true worship, living, living the purpose and and the dream of God for your life. That, that is true. It's got everything to do with who the Father created you to be. Created by God for God. True worship is only possible through fellowship with the Holy Spirit. True worship is characterized by living for God. Our purpose, true worship is characterized by having fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. I, I think this is important. We cannot offer true worship if it's not offered through the Holy Spirit. So, let's just talk about this. We cannot live true worship if we do not, if we're not led by the Holy Spirit in intimacy with the Lord. True worship begins where we become one with God, where we begin to engage the Spirit. just want to say something more about this. Say with me, engaging the Spirit. Look at this. So, I'm just going to touch on, on two of these characteristics for today. And then we're going to go into communion. Look at this. Say with me, intimacy with God. You cannot live a life to the glory and the honor of God if there is no closeness, oneness, relationship building kind of intimacy with God. And that's not possible without the Holy Spirit. I'll say something about that right now. But listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew, Matthew 15 verse 17 to 9. He says, you hypocrites. And Jesus was talking to the, to the religious mob of the day, Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of religious law. He called them hypocrites. Why did he call them hypocrites? Skynheiliches. He says, well did Isaiah prophesy of you. These people say they honor me. In other words, they say they honor me. Another translation says they honor me with their words. So they sing all the songs. They, say, they lift their hands and say, we love you, we love you, Lord, we honor you. But what's the problem? Their hearts are far away. What did Jesus say? Those who want to worship the Father must worship Him in spirit and in. So your heart must be engaged. Your heart, your spirit must be engaged in true worship. That's why Jesus said you, your true self, who you are, to, right to the core, to the being of who you are, must, be, must come before God. Your attention, your focus must be on Him. And I think this is where many Christians miss true worship because their hearts are not engaged. Their spirit is not engaged. Jesus said that is not true worship. What does He say? What does He call such worship in verse 9? He says, their worship is 
worthless. If you want to understand the core meaning of worship, it's to bring something that's of worth, that means something to you. And you cannot do that if your heart and spirit and everything is not engaged. If you look at worship in the Old Testament, you'll see that's why they always brought physical sacrifices before God. They brought something that's of worth that would hurt their heart. They gave until it was hurting to make it meaningful. The same with Mary when she anointed the feet of Jesus with that, uh, with, with that expensive perfume. She gave, uh, I think that was maybe, and we, I want to say something about that, but maybe not today. She gave something that was worth a, a, a year's wages and salaries. You understand? So, so Jesus says, you can, you can talk, 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 but I know what's happening in your heart. I know if you're paying attention to me. I know if you're focused on me. I know if your spirit is engaged. You can talk, 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 but if your spirit is not engaged, if your heart is not engaged, your worship is... Ask yourself, not your neighbor, is my worship worthy of God? <laughs> don't ask yourself if it's worthless. Please don't even say that word when you speak to yourself. <laughs> okay. What about you? Is your worship, is our worship worthy? Listen, church, was God glorified here this morning with people who came? And when we lift our hands, it wasn't just to follow religious protocol or do stuff because that was what charismatic people are doing now. But we lift it because there was, a, there was a, a, a humility before God, a dependence and understanding of how dependent I am before Him. And say, oh Lord, I engage my heart and my spirit and I worship You. And I honor You. Receive the glory of my life, Lord. You're so awesome. You're so great. And now we begin to sing His praises. We begin to thank Him. We begin to sing the songs. But you see, all the praising, singing, talking means nothing if your heart is not humbled before God. Can I get a big amen there? <laughs> your true self has to be engaged. Your true self has to be engaged. Now, you know, when we talk about, and by the way, when we talk about, let's just, I want to mention just two words, um, two, two words in the Hebrew, shacha, which means to, to prostrate, to bow and to prostrate one before God. Um, and the word uh, in homage, you know, in homage, to prostrate in homage, this homage means to show deep respect and fear and reverence for the presence of God. You know, sometimes the way people talk about God and uh, the attitude just shows that they couldn't care less. Have you, have you seen people like that? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> it's just like, I, I couldn't care less. I don't care. But this word shacha means to prostrate in homage. There's a word in Greek, proskaneo. We're talking worship. Why? Because it's the month of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. How? By living a lifestyle of worship. So what's worship? Proskaneo in the Greek. The word proskuneo in the Greek is to bow before God. Um, is to bow. Actually, this word means is to bow and then to kiss the hand of somebody. And I've studied this word. If you really study it, it illustrates how a, a, a dog would come and, and, and come in a, in a humble way. Have you seen when a dog comes, especially when they were naughty? They come in a humble way and they kiss the hand of their master. Have you ever seen a dog doing stuff like that? That's the illustration connected to the word proskuneo. Now, please, God does not see you as a dog. Then to your name and tell him, you're not a dog. You're not a subject. Don't worry. That's not what pastor is saying. <laughs> I was talking about maybe some of you, the dogs you have at home. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But what's the point? The point is that humility coming before God. The spirit is engaged. I worship and I honor. And now when I sing, and I open my mouth, it comes from a place of humility and dependence before God. The two greatest enemies of true worship, what are they? Pride and religion. Religion means you do all these things, but your heart is still not engaged. Your worship is worthless. 
Pride means you're not, you're not going to allow yourself to humble yourself before God so that there's intimacy between you and God. You, you're not that type. It doesn't suit your personality. It doesn't suit who you are. You know, you, you, you are, there's going to be no prostrate in homage, shakha. There's no going to be no proskaneo to bow and to kiss the hand. There's going to be no such things because you're a, you're a proud person. And your religion, to be honest, is personal. You see, but worship says, no, if you want to worship me, Jesus said, you have to engage the spirit, come before God. The other problem is many of the charismatic people, they can do all the dancing, singing, making moves about worship, you know, and they just go through the motions. But the thing is, is your heart engaged? God is after the heart. I want to say to somebody here today, God doesn't care what you do, who you are what you believe about yourself. He, he, he cares about your heart. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things I say. Here he says, here he says, um, you hypocrites. These people say they honor me, but their hearts are far away from me. What is the worship that we bring before the Lord? Is your heart engaged? People, the only way we can do that is through the help of the Holy Spirit. If, listen to me, if it involves your spirit, what did Jesus say? True worship is to engage the spirit and be in pursuit of, come on, say it one, one more time with me, to engage the spirit. That's the intimacy part, the oneness, the closeness, where we prostrate, where we bow, where we come, and then... And then from there, we're in pursuit of truth. Now, what did Jesus say? Those who want to worship God must worship in spirit and truth. In other words, listen, we cannot worship God unless we're led by the Holy Spirit. Unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. This is why, if you, listen, if you take the Holy Spirit out of worship, you're left with religion. Because the Holy Spirit indwells the, heart, the, the spirit of man. Your spirit is the place where you communicate with God. Did you know that? It's the place from where we communicate with God. The Spirit is where the Holy Spirit lives in. And, and the Holy Spirit comes. He regenerated your heart. And from there, He leads you into the presence of God. He connects you with the Father and the Son. He reveals the Father. He reveals Jesus in your life. Remember, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will testify of me. He shows you Jesus. He shows you the Father and what happened in worship. You lift your hands and you say, oh, Jesus. I worship you. I honor you. And you begin to say, oh, Abba, Abba, Father, why, how, why can we say Abba? Because the Holy Spirit reveals to us that the Father has adopted you through the Son. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Adoption. Are you with me, people? <laughs> we cannot, you, cannot, you cannot worship without the Holy Spirit. He leads you, and He guides you, and He fill you, fills your heart, and He ushers you in the presence of God. And the man of, he's the one who makes you aware of the presence of God. Have you ever experienced the presence and the glory of God in your life where you could experience God is here? It's the Holy Spirit who manifests the presence of God. Listen to the word of God in, um, let's just look at Philippians 3 verse 3. That's why the word says in Philippians 3 verse, verse 3, yes, we're not going to read anything, everything, so, you know, you can continue. Um, we, for we worship by the, we worship by the, we proskuneo, we shecha, prostrate and homage, show respect, humility and dependence. How? By the Holy Spirit. That's not a, something you do from the flesh, by the Holy Spirit. If you take the Holy Spirit away from worship, we're left with religion. There's nothing left. We left with a place. We left with liturgical components. We left with a program. We are left with a gathering, but there's no power of God. We need the Holy Spirit in true worship. And I want to ask you today, are you still filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you fellowship with Him? Do you allow Him to lead you in every part of your life? Because if you don't, it's going to be difficult to ask Him to lead you when you get to worship. And that's why it, sometimes it takes people a very long time before they really begin to get into worship and honor God because somewhere our relationship, our fellowship with the Holy Spirit has stopped. The Holy Spirit, listen now, gives you 
I want to call it the gifts. Yeah, he gives you the gifts to worship. One of those gifts we read about in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 to 15, where the word of God says, For if I pray in tongues, my, my spirit is praying. Are you with me? Let's do this together, and then we will get into the communion. Amen. <laughs> but I think it's important if we're going to understand worship. So what did Jesus say? True worship engaged the spirit and leads us in the pursuit of truth. Rather, and then from there, we are in pursuit of truth. So Paul was talking about the Holy Spirit, and he says, For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. People listen to me, speaking in tongues is so controversial in our day and time. Even some charismatic believers say, well, I don't know about that. They, they are like the Samaritan woman when Jesus taught her uh, what true worship was all about. She said, well, I don't know about that. When you talk to some people about tongues, they will tell you, well, I, I don't know about that. And people are, I want to encourage you today without giving you offense. You need the Holy Spirit to bring and offer true worship to God. Some people will tell you, but tongues is when you speak tongues and people from other languages understand that. But you see, that is not the truth. There's a tongue that's given to you as a prayer language, as a worship language. Because, your, listen, your vocabulary falls short when it comes to praising and worshiping God. You've got only so much, many words. Can I get a big amen? And when those words stop, because God is so big and so great... And so awesome and so mighty, you go, oh, ke bros, tremendele What happens? You pray, you worship God. Your, what does the Bible say? Your mind does not understand. Could anybody understand what I was just saying? Well, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, and there's interpretation for that, because that's another kind of gift that can also work. Can I get a big Amen. It's amazing in our information era, you know, that you get people, they are charismatics, but they neglect the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We cannot worship if we do not have the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you cannot worship if you haven't yet received the gifts. I'm saying you should desire those gifts to be a better worshiper. I'm saying do not be negative. I'm saying don't criticize. You know, the other day, um, I, uh, I looked uh, somewhere on social media, uh, a person came up and they speak in tongues and they say, this is not from the Lord. But I could hear that, that the tongue, what they thought were tongues, is not tongues. I could hear that they were not filled with the Holy Spirit. So you get crazy things, controversial things, negative things. People are afraid of the Holy Spirit. But I want to encourage you today, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be careful, be careful to criticize and be negative about the things of the Holy Spirit. But have this attitude, oh Lord, I don't know everything, but I desire to be a better worshiper. I desire intimacy. I desire your truth. I desire to love you, Lord, better. If you pray like that, if you change your heart, if you humble yourself, you'll be surprised what the Holy Spirit will come and do for you because He did it for me. He did it for me at a very young age. Come on, church. But you see, we need to have faith. It's amazing how many people we have that they call themselves people of faith, but they've lost the faith. And now they're critical, cynical, everything is a problem. <laughs> Are you with me? So let's look at this. So Paul was explaining. He says, if, if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. There are times that you understand. That's a different place for tongues. We'll get to that maybe late in the year. Verse 15 says, well then, what shall I do? He says, I will pray in the spirit and I will also pray in words. I understand. So I will, when it comes to worship, I will, Oh Lord, I praise and I honor and I lift your holy name on high. Does that make sense? That's what Paul was saying here. I don't care what exegesis you follow, how good a Greek scholar you are, you're going to get arrive at the, exactly the same place. That's if you're a person of faith. Otherwise, you've a theologian have lost your faith and you're afraid of the Holy Spirit. Why are you so quiet? <laughs> Okay, verse 15, well then, what shall we do? I'll pray in the Spirit. And go read this. And I understand the context is the, is the assembly. So Paul was discouraging people from speaking too much in tongues in a public meeting. Why? Because people don't understand. But he never meant for people not to pray, uh, pray and worship in tongues. That's why he explained. 
in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 to 15. What shall we then do? I'll pray in the Spirit. I'll also pray in words. I understand. Listen to this one. I will sing in the Spirit. I will sing in a language that I cannot understand. So somebody say, no, tongues, listen, tongues is only for interpretation and that other people may understand. No, 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 Paul says you will worship in tongues and you won't understand. Are you with me? That's a good exegesis, people. <laughs> From a good student of Greek, a good scholar of the original text, I promise you, you, can't, you won't find any better. He says, and I will also sing in words I understand, and I pray to God that we will begin to offer him that kind of worship in our church. So that the glory may manifest, people's lives may be changed. Because I can tell you, we can preach, 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 sing, 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 have programs and protocols. Nothing will change unless the Holy Spirit arrives on the scene. <laughs> Hallelujah. Touch somebody and say, come on, let's do this. Let's love God again. Let's love Him. Let's love Him. Okay, let's end. I know it's hot in this place and we need to get to communion. But I just want to say, what did Jesus say? True spirit engages, a uh, true worship engages the spirit in, in, why? To be in the pursuit of truth and, and doing the will of God. In other words, you need to get to that place where there's intimacy between you and God, where you build relationship, you hear his heartbeat. But did you hear what I say? Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Listen, the definition of intimacy is you want to write this down? It just come to my mind or my spirit now. The definition of intimacy is getting as close as God as you can. Mary got as close to Jesus as she could. That's why she sat at his feet. That's the definition of intimacy right there. Getting as close to God as it's allowable. <laughs> to say it differently. I hope there's a word in English like allowable, but you get what I'm saying. So, and if, if, if there's no intimacy, you will not live in truth. Truth is fulfilling God's will. That's why worship is your purpose in, in life. Truth is Jesus. Truth is the gospel. Truth is how God sees you. Truth is what God wants you to do. How God wants you to fulfill your purpose. Truth is you're a witness. You're a model of Jesus. That's truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. Listen, and the Holy Spirit, say with me, the Holy Spirit illuminates the truth. <sighs> Listen, can you remember when Jesus came up after he was baptized? There was two manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Some people disagree. They said that there was only one. Go study it again. There were two. There was what? Jesus came and he, and, and after he came up from the baptismal pool, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a what? Of a, uh, it's just a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to explain that today. The other manifestation was, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, and the word there is the word alighting. He illuminated Jesus. What's the point? The point is the Holy Spirit lights on the truth. <sighs> Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, I I'll teach you something about worship. But you have to engage your spirit, and from there you will understand the heartbeat, and truth will be eliminate, uh, illuminated for you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and you will know where to go and what to do. And if you go where you're supposed to do, and do what you're supposed to do, you will worship me in every part of your life. It's a lifestyle of worship. That's how you love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. All your understanding. Can I get an amen? Lift your hands and say, Lord, help me to be a true worshiper. Help me to love you, Lord. Lord, sometimes I'm confused like a Samaritan woman. Sometimes I can only say when I hear these things, I don't know, I don't know, but I want to be a better worshiper. I want to love you again, Lord. Forgive me for where my worship have faltered, failed you. I want to love you, my God, all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my strength. I want to love neighbor as I love myself. I want to fulfill my purpose in life, 
Lord, I pray, reveal yourself to people. There's some people, Lord, they've never experienced your presence. They've never experienced intimacy. They've never experienced closeness, oneness with God. I pray this morning, Lord, may they encounter you like never before. Touch, change, stir. Oh God, stir. And Holy Spirit, come and lead us in all the truth. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Heere. I do what I can do in every heart and soul. Amen. I conclude with John 14, 15 to 17. What does Jesus say about true worship? He says, the spirit has to be engaged. It's a hard thing. You have to be in pursuit of truth. Only the Holy Spirit can lead you in truth. Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit alone can lead you in truth. John 14, 15 to 17. If you love me, that's what we're talking about, loving God. Amen? <laughs> For if, if you've missed it in the beginning, where you were still kind of getting into service mode. <laughs> uh, this is our new sermon series. <laughs> we're going to talk about loving God. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Don't just talk, 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 lift hands, lift hands, sing, sing, sing. No. That's good if it comes from the heart. But he says here, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> the, the proof is in the cheesecake. <laughs> For those of you who heard what I said earlier, okay. Just bringing some context to the sermon. <laughs> what? Obey. Be in pursuit of truth. Do the will of God. Obey what? My? What are the commandments of Jesus? Loving God. Loving neighbor as I love myself. Turn to somebody and say to them, I'm supposed to love you just the way I love myself. <laughs> oh, that, that's your immediate neighbor, but you've got many other neighbors. Amen. And it was easy to say this because it's your brother or your sister or your spouse. It's a different thing when you get to school tomorrow or university or when you get to work and business and there are tough challenges. And God says, I want you to pursue my truth where you live and move and have your being. Verse 16, and I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate, Greek, paraclete, parakletos, the one who's called to my sight, to aid me, to lead me, to guide me, to comfort me, to strengthen me, to counsel me, and many more. That's the Holy Spirit. You cannot live without the Holy Spirit. You have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to give the Holy Spirit his rightful place in your heart and say, lead me. Lead me when I raise my kids. Lead me to love my spouse. Lead me in my work. Give me the creativity. Lead me, in, lead me in every area, department of my life. Holy Spirit, lead me. I need you. Listen. So Jesus said, do my commandments, but you can't do it without the paraclete. Verse 17, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into, who leads in the truth? The Holy Spirit. There's no way for us to worship without the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, engage the Spirit in pursuit of truth, he's talking to that woman about the role that the Holy Spirit would play in true worship. Let's come back to true worship. Serve God, honor God, be in pursuit of his presence and his glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to ask the people who's helping us with the communion this morning. Uh, please to come. And once again, I want to thank, uh, uh, really thank the people for a, a lovely table because of a, a, anything that gets effort is praise worthy. It's for Jesus. So we thank the Lord for any, any kind of effort that people are putting in for His glory, for His honor in Jesus' name. Thank you. This table is not just for visitors. Oh, sorry for members, that <laughs> includes visitors, table is for everyone. You say, well, I'm not from this denomination. You say, well, I'm not baptized. I, I have not yet done anything. This is not, this table is never connected to anything but the finished work of Jesus Christ for your cross. You say, well, I, I feel I'm a bad person. I'm not worthy. The table is because we are not worthy. All of us are not worthy. You need Jesus. There's only one way to partake of this table in an unworthy manner, and that is when you disrespect God. Like the example Paul used, the people came and they ate 
all the bread because they were hungry and they drank all the wine because apparently they were thirsty. <laughs> okay, that's unworthy. But apart from that, if you need Jesus, if you need forgiveness, if you need healing, if you need change in your life, if you say, I cannot continue like this, this is the table of the Lord for you. Amen. Let's partake of the bread and uh, you, you, oh, you can continue. Thank you. The bread. Lord, thank you that we declare these are as the elements of your communion. The body of Jesus that was broken, also pointing and representing the veil that was torn, that separated the holy from the most holy place, that prevented people to have access to the presence and the glory of God. When Jesus died, gave his last breath, that veil that prevented people from intimacy with God was broken. Isn't it precious? His body was also broken so that we can be made whole and be restored. Thank him for his body this morning. We'll pray in a minute. But right there where you are, just thank him that now you can have access to intimacy, to the most holy place, to his presence, to his glory. Why would we not make use of this privilege? Come boldly this morning, the Lord says. To my throne of grace where you will receive mercy and grace to help in just the right time. Come boldly. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Father, thank you so much that you loved the world so much that you gave your only begotten son, Jesus. The way you gave him, Lord, that shows us how much you love us. Because he bled and died. His body was broken. His blood was shed in seven different places. So that we can have access to your kingdom, to your presence, to the most holy place. Help us, Lord, to be in pursuit of this presence, to be in pursuit of oneness, closeness, intimacy with you in Jesus' name. Thank you, my Father. Amen. Let's partake. Thank you. Let's continue also with the, the ministry of the cup. Uh, Jesus called it the cup of blessing. Uh, the blood of, an, of a new covenant, of better promises. When you look at the cup this morning, it speaks of the blood of Jesus. The life is in the blood. Forgiveness is in the blood. Healing is in the blood of Jesus. And if, listen, if, you, if there's a sickness in your body, I want you to Declare the healing of Jesus in your body as you partake. If you need forgiveness, you know you've sinned, you're not sure if your heart's right with the Lord, just come to Him. Pray your own prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for what I've done. Lord, I want to make sure my name's written in heaven's book of life. Jesus, I surrender to you. Help me to love you. Help me to be a true worshiper. You can do this on a regular basis at home. Especially if you're trusting God for something in your life. Gather your family. Sit around the table. Talk about the basics of the gospel. Partake of the cup. Declare healing over your body. And don't stop until you see change. Even if it takes a month or two or a year or two. It doesn't matter. Stand on the word of God, the best is yet to come because Jesus paid the price for that. Here's the proof. He paid the price. John 14, verse 15 to 17, before we partake. Sorry. First uh, John 4, verse 9 to 10. God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. God showed us how much He loved us. Verse 10, this is real love. If we look at the table this morning, it's real love. God gave everything up, His only begotten Son. Not that we have loved God. We haven't loved God first, but that He loved us. He loved us first, sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sin.
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the cup. You loved us so much that you gave your son, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. We pray, help us to have revelation of what you've done for us so that we can in response worship you, love you like never before. I pray that you encounter and touch every heart and soul here this morning in Jesus' name. Just take one minute and speak to God. Recommit yourself to God right now. Surrender to Him. If there's anything you feel, I need to repent of this thing. I need to ask forgiveness. Do that now. Come back to God. Use the time here this morning. If there's anything serious you're trusting God for, anything you feel like you need this cup to minister, this is the cup of blessing, the new covenant. Speak to God now. And I believe you will receive what you've asked for. If that's in God's will and in God's time.